So there are uh, three parts to the question. Uh, let me begin with Bangladesh and the significance of Bangladesh coming up with the Indo-Pacific outlook. Uh, when we started the Indian Ocean Conference, the arrangement which we now as the Quad, which is the Indo-Pacific uh, arrangement, was still in the making. It hadn't taken full shape, full form and full functionality. Uh, what has happened is, as the Indian Ocean Conference has moved forward, so has the idea of the Indo-Pacific, uh, a, a free, open, safe, uh, a free, open, secure and inclusive Indo-Pacific. That concept has also moved almost parallelly and uh, Bangladesh coming up with its uh, outlook on the Indo-Pacific is very, very significant because uh, the movement has been very graded. We had the Bay of Bengal states, then we had the Indian Ocean states and now we have the Indo-Pacific states. And Bangladesh, by uh, sort of marking itself with the emerging Indo-Pacific uh, security doctrine, uh, or you call it the economic doctrine, or you call it just uh, the larger mu multilateral arrangement which is taking form now, is extremely significant and more importantly, not only have they prepared their own charter for the, the way they look at the Indo-Pacific arrangement, they have also put it in the public domain, which if you remember, external affairs minister lauded Bangladesh not only for coming up with the outlook, but also placing it in the public domain. That is the first part of it. The second part is, uh, this year's Indian Ocean Conference revolves around the theme of peace, partnership and prosperity. So, obviously, our external affairs minister focused on that part of it, that there has to be partnership and without partnership, there cannot be peace and without peace, there cannot be prosperity. Uh, partnerships can again be multilateral, they can all be plurilateral, uh, not multilateral, but plurilateral, they can be bilateral, they can be uh, trilateral, but it is necessary that countries in the Indian Ocean start looking for partners within the Indian Ocean countries. It is important that the leadership from the Indian Ocean region becomes leadership of the Indian Ocean region. Uh, and uh, it is important that there should be some amount of consensus uh, among the Indian Ocean countries on key issues of uh, development and prosperity. Now, one of the key issues of uh, development and prosperity is resilience. And especially after the pandemic and because of the climate change impact, importance of resilience cannot be overstressed. It has, there, we are looking at climate resilience, we are looking at supply chain resilience, we are looking at infrastructure resilience. And uh, while broadly, if you look at it from the climate perspective, resilience would be related to climate change, the impact of climate change, uh, and how it, how it sort of determines what should be the future uh, pattern of development, uh, 
uh, an infrastructure building that is of course the technical part of it but there is a political part of it is your is your infrastructure resilient enough to withstand financial shocks i am just putting it very simply uh, and that is the point which external affairs minister s jay shankar made that when you go in for huge infra projects which are externally funded and in this case funded by china you are happy that you have got a uh, highway expressway bridge or a port or whatever but end of the day the bill is left with you you have to pay for it and experience tells us that countries in the indian ocean region which have used this option for creating infrastructure are now stranded with huge debts and uh, there is a crisis now, there are countries which have um, which have debts which uh, they owe to china that is more than their budget for the year the 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 repayment amount there are countries and we have seen what happened in sri lanka there are countries uh, which which uh, sort of now find themselves trapped in debt and this makes the purpose of that infrastructure questionable and it it sort of makes that infra, such infrastructure non resilient in the sense that they may they may be climate change proof but they 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 don't sort of uh, they they become a burden for the government of the day or the country not only the government but the people of the country and the money that goes into servicing that debt is diverted from sdgs and uh, when your development goals suffer like whether it is health whether it is education whether it is housing whether it is uh, creating job opportunities when all that is impacted because you have to divert money from your uh, earnings the government's earnings to repay loans to china then the whole structure the whole system becomes non resilient so he did very well by highlighting this aspect and the third thing is that i think all indian ocean countries now need to seriously think and talk and work towards creating some sort of an architecture which spans all of the indian ocean and merges into the indo pacific on climate change and its impact and how to mitigate the impact of climate change for the not only individual progress of countries but the collective progress of the indian ocean region so these are some of the key takeaways because in the other sessions other speakers have spoken about it and it is good to see that there is at least some sort of an emerging um, interest in a coalition of uh indian ocean region countries to deal with problems that are specific to the indian ocean region i mean after all you cannot there cannot be a one size fits all solution and and non indian ocean region countries cannot decide or must not or should not be deciding for the indian ocean region countries as to how they are how they should be dealing with the problem of climate and uh, trying to achieve climate mitigation